Mexico's fairly recent democracy has been constantly challenged uh, with the idea of enhancing growth and equalities within its borders. Our democracy inherited a polarized country with polarized political platforms. Uh, the vision which had represented a continuous obstacle for our progress, for our growth. Uh, as Abraham Lincoln once said, um, I'm a slow walker, but I never walk back. Our democracy has been indeed uh, a slow walker. We have nonetheless reached a current stage in which democracy has gained momentum with more mature political and participation skills, not only from our three branches of government, but also from our citizens, from us. These new alliances have allowed the culmination of structural reforms that were once unprecedented or hard to think of uh, in aspects such as education, labor, energy, and political and, and economic competition. On the other side of things, uh, we have also just encountered tragic events which show our, our pending challenges, our pending duties regarding the rule of law in, in Mexico. Challenges that are non nonetheless being dealt with at a federal and local level, with efforts such as the design of a new national system against corruption. Uh, because there will always be challenges for a fairly young democracy as ours, as one in, in Mexico, but we should keep in mind that the new reforms as accomplishments of intergovernmental cooperation are a great sign of our progress. We must, therefore, keep taking steps forward, never backwards. Even more, we're facing a great challenge such as rule of law and human rights. Mexico needs to rise against this challenge. Uh, to expand further with these issues, we will hear our two guest speakers here today, both of whom kindly accept our, inv our invitation. First, we have Carlos Solar from Chile, a PhD candidate at our university, the University of York. He did his bachelor's degree in journalism and a master's degree in politics. Carlos will talk about Mexico's current challenges regarding national security. Then, Ruben Martinez from Mexico, also a PhD candidate at the University of York. Uh, he has a bachelor's degree in economics and a master's in economics and public policy. Ruben will touch upon the economic aspects and opportunities within our current circumstances. Uh, last but not least, when our speakers are done, we will open the floor to all of you to hear all your questions, doubts, or comments. Once again, welcome, and thank you for coming. Uh, well, let, let, let me start by thanking you, Walid and, and Lorena, for inviting me to this event. Uh, I'm truly honored to participate. Uh, both in my category of being a non-Mexican, and also because, uh, well, a lot of people has gathered uh, this evening to to hear about two fundamental aspects of Mexico today. It will uh, that will be uh, its security and its economy. Uh, so first, I need to say that actually the title of this presentation, um, "Are We Going Towards a Safer Mexico?" Uh, uh, that's something I came up obviously before the regretful events in the state of Guerrero. So. Now, the title of the presentation, Towards a Safer Mexico, might sound a bit contradictory, right? Because maybe we'll need to put a question mark at the end. Are we going uh, exactly towards a safer, a safer Mexico or not? So at, at least uh, the title, it, it was quite questionable, but, but I'll try to uh, come up with a story to tell you why we should think about trying to make Mexico a safer country. Uh, I would like to start my analysis first by traveling back in time a little bit uh, and focusing in the, president, in the presidency, the administration of former President Felipe Calderón, sexenio, uh, or six years in Spanish, uh, that occurred between 2006 and 2007, and 2012, I'm sorry. Uh, for those of you who have not taken a, an intro to Mexican politics yet, <laughs> uh, current Mexican president is obviously Mr. En Enrique Peña Nieto, who got elected in 2012 for a new sexenio. So uh, Mr. Peña Nieto and former Mr. Calderón, former president Mr. Calderón, are from two different political parties. First from the Institutional Revolutionary Party, or the PRI, and the latter from the National Action Party, the PAN. These are two of the three biggest parties in Mexico, which also includes uh, the Party of the Democratic Revolution, or the PRD. 
So in terms of political position from right to, from right to left, we'll go from the PAN, the PRI, and the PRD. So now uh, the question is why to start with uh, uh, exploring a little bit more about Mr. Calderon's <laughs> government. Well, simply, uh, uh, and not because we tend to associate Mr. Calderon with one of the last uh, higher peaks of, on the wave of, uh, on the war of, on drugs in Mexico, but because to understand what's going on these days, what's going on currently with Mr. Peña Nieto's security paradox, it is necessary to put a few things in context. So uh, obviously Mr. Calderon enjoyed a boost in the economy that translated into better social policies for Mexico. There are some indicators that improve, such as longer life expectancy, uh, better education, and some, uh, <laughs> and some uh, reduction in extreme poverty, right? So from a political perspective, Actually, Mexico has strengthened its democratic legi legitimacy during Mr. Calderon's presidency, okay? That's, a ro the, that's the rocky path that started when Vicente Fox, former president from the PAN, defeated uh, Lambas Francisco Lambastido Ochoa and the 71-year rule of the PRI came to an end in 2000. Uh, I will go uh, to talk about more of the PRI a little bit later. So, however, uh, besides these good things that Calderon tried to improve in, in Mexican democracy. Obviously, there is a huge uh, uh, effort that he tried to legitimize democracy effectively in Mexico. He, he obviously clashed with the illegal, but in some parts, uh, it's been sadly legitimized, the business of organized crime, uh, which is an issue that ended up overshad overshadowing most of the top policy agenda priorities that uh, Mr. Calderon had. And that obviously it has spilled over the presidency of Mr. Peña Nieto as well, as we are seeing uh, currently with events in the state of Guerrero. Uh, so uh, Mr. Calderon concentrated on a hard and direct anti-crime uh, strategy while trying to show the world that Mexico was not failing into the failed state category. In despite of, of obviously the inability of the country's institutions to cope with the criminal environment that was rising. Uh, most of the works being published until now um, directly approach the security crisis in Mexico. Uh, and obviously, uh, they tend to blame the, the Calderon's presidency. Nonetheless, it is short-sighted to assume that the, cri the crisis of security in Mexico originated during the last decade or, or originated during Calderon's decade. To be more accurate, we have to think that during Calderon's presidency, Mexicans experienced the explosion of a long and historic negligence of the Mexican authorities to make changes necessary to prevent a crisis of public security. So let's concentrate now on a different but crucial perspectives in understanding how Mexico's spiral of, of violence developed through recent history. First, to understand this crisis, emergency, collapse, or whatever adjective we might call the, the state of Mexican security today, uh, we need to combine different points of view in order to analyze how things have, have come to be. As a first issue, we need to demythify that Mexico is entering or has ever entered into the failed state category. The state failure, even though it's, it's, it's quite uh, wide use in Latin America, this was coined by the U.S. Defense Department to launch the militarization and the securitization of Colombia during the late uh, 1980s, especially to fight the cartels. Uh, there are some scholars like Paul Kenny and Monica Serrano who draw a clear distinction on this. They argue that Mexico, unlike the president of Colombia, uh, we are not in the presence of a state, but rather security failure. And they believe that by security failure, one should understand the Mexican state inability to control security threats, no more, no less. <coughs> However, the distinction between a state failure and security failure is easily to become, it can become easily blurred. Why? Because of the political strategy that Mr. Calderon and the U.S. tried to recreate, when they tried to recreate 2000's uh, Plan Colombia on Mexican soil, a plan referred to as the Merida Initiative. The Merida Initiative was a strategy to have the Mexican armed forces to do the policing, the policing of highly violent organized crime with Washington's training, equipment, and intelligence. So at the end of the day, this revealed, however, that Calderon's political narrative was closer to an evident risk of a state failure rather than a security fail agenda. So 
uh, Kenny and Serrano, these two scholars, also shed some light on these security narratives and delivered two lenses to visual visualize this security failure. First, uh, they imply that the Mexican state has failed its obligation to protect its citizens from internal security. And second, they emphasize in the country's spillover of violence abroad, both north into the United States and south to Central America. If one could link the security failure to some key actors and issues that played a protagonist or by this day an antagonist role when trying to overcome crime and violence, one should mostly mention a weak criminal justice system, an inefficient police force and a vilified respect for human rights. So let's start with the criminal justice system. Researcher Ana Laura Magaloni explored why Mexican criminal justice system has failed so spectacularly in tackling serious crime in the face of public indignation and increasing demand for a change in the system. Uh, in one of her papers, she, she used a statistical approach to correlate two variables, inefficiency and arbitrariness. As you might imagine, both results were positively correlated. So the author asserts truly, and, and here I open quotes, democratic Mexico has a criminal justice system that is not only equipped to work for, that is only equipped to work for authoritarian Mexico, end of quotes. So uh, Magaloni is arguing that getting tough on criminal on the crime on crime will not work in a judicial system characterized by an unprofessional criminal investigation apparatus, high impunity, and institutional inertia. Just to make it more grim, she concludes that the unwanted institutional legacy of the Mexican authoritarian era is far from slipping away if drastic changes to the prosecutional system, incentives for justice operators, and proofs of incorruptibility are not taken seriously. So next on our list, let's review what role a successful police reform process should take. Like Magalon Magaloni, there is another Mexican scholar, Ernesto Lopez Portillo, who pinpoint what is wrong with the current policy, police agent agencies. His approach reveals two issues of neglect, one of salaries and another of supervision. The first, the salaries, is well-known recognized problem of the low wages that police officers earn in Mexico especially those at the municipal level. This situation has led to police agents not only taking risk to confront crime, but for a miserable pay paycheck at the end of the month, but also, and more seriously, to collude with organized crime for a second payroll. And Lopez Portillo's second observation refers to the lack of accountability and trans transparency in the police agencies. Mexico has not resolved the issue with the supervision of standards and practices of its police resulting in a chronic inconsistency between the law enforcement, where I open quotes, the rule of the games for the police are geared towards incentives of their own opportunity, not towards defending society's rule of law, end of quotes. Uh, Mexican police force known complicity with drug traffickers ignited Calderon's decision to order the military to step in in the fight against organized crime groups. So assuring that the police had been permeated with corruption and was incapable of increasing wave of the, the, the increasing wave of crime and violence in the country, especially what we saw uh, from 2008 onwards in the Mexican-U.S. border. Uh, uh, currently, uh, uh, we've, we've heard President Peña Nieto intention to intervene as well the police department of Iguala in Guerrero, actually he did, in virtue of the tragedy of the 43 normalistas from Ayotzinapa. So now, if we put a pause on the contingent politics, I look for some sort of historical explanation to understand where we are in the analysis. We should make it in a couple of minutes into debating about the patterns that connect actually 20th century Mexican institutional consolidation and the current uh, security situation. Uh, the analysis takes us into two rather opposite directions, sort of like the same that happened with Mr. Calderon's uh, uh, outcomes of his presidency. One is towards Mexico obviously consolidating democracy and rule of law, and another is towards insecurity, militarization, the multiplication of non-state armed forces, and a growing consolidation of obscured forms of violence. Uh, Paul Gillingham, who, who specializes in state formation and nationalism in modern Mexico, details the, details the high levels of violence in the countryside after 1940. He argues how rural Mexico remained a profoundly violent place where homicides, rebellions, riots, rapes, petty massacres, 
and forced migrations were the key commodities in the perpetrators' economic, social, or political strategies when bargaining for social capital. In a post-revolutionary context in which society was obviously left in arms, the emergence of violent entrepreneurship swept away all attempts by the following governments to demobilize regional caciques, peasant militias, or right-wing paramilitaries. So Gillingham argues how state and local actors were left to negotiate the control of higher levels of violence with the main violent agencies, who were the army, the defensas rurales, and the police, and obviously the pistoleros, or the gunmen. Gillingham analysis provides a good understanding of how the Mexican state since the early post-revolutionary era has been incapable of managing public order with, without, from time to time, relying heavily on the army's assistance. In states such as... Uh, In states such as Veracruz and Guerrero, for instance, social control started to rely on functioning police agencies, courts, and the penitentiary system only by the second half of the 20th century. This move also came together with the decentralization of state and police violence. Even though the government remained under the order of a state and local politicians, assassinations were accepted as long as they were disguised, covert, and suspicious. Authorities wanted to diminish their visibility in state violence, withdrawing the army from the violent repression, but keeping less explicit control by using non-state private armed groups to maintain a state order. In this sense, the so-called exceptionality of Mexico prior to 1980 did not lay in the absence of political violence, rather in the hidden nature of this violence. So during the breakdown of the pre-hegemony pre in the 1980s, a, syst a systemic scenario of a state and counter-state violence started to be revealed. In this line, during the late 1960s through the 1980s, significant political challenges at home and policy developments abroad marked the beginning of a rough era for Mexico. This is where I retake on current events and bring into discussion Mexico's relationship with the US, an important factor that was missing from the story. When the US government boosted the eradication of drug crops in Asia and closed the Caribbean route for drug trafficking in early 90s, traffickers searched for new alternative ways to, to satisfy the North American demand. Sadly, Mexico was the obvious choice. Scholars like Peter Watt and Robert Cepeda listed the key factors that gave traffickers huge incentives for moving their business to Mexico. First, the proximity to the US, the world's largest drug market, a corrupt political class, Security, security authorities involved in the trafficking, a proper geography and climate for cultivation, and low-level workers in need of employment and willing to take the risks. A couple of decades earlier, in the early 1970, uh, former president, Mexican president Luis Echeverri Alvarez from the 1970 to 1976, and Richard Nixon had already agreed on a strong link to start a permanent war on drugs. Uh, this was obviously held by a populist Cold War rhetoric that helped authorities in Mexico to gain citizen support at home and assured financial support from Washington by associating all political activism with criminality and drug trafficking. Consequently, it, it also cleared the way to involve the military in the fight against insurgency and drug trafficking. And however, has, as Watt and Cepeda argue, open quotes, the scale of the business and the profits generated for government bodies and corrupt officials meant that illegal activities will be tolerated." Close quotes. So uh, what do we have in the mid-80s, for example, in Mexico? The PRI was controlling the drug business by controlling trade. Traffickers will pay off top politicians who in return will provide police and army protection and a secure monopoly of La Plaza. What is La Plaza? La Plaza is a system ensured in it's a system that ensured impunity to traffickers and certain state control over who was doing the trafficking business and who was carrying away the violence. So state involvement in narco-trafficking increased in the 90s and only to decrease when neoliberal and political reforms reversed the trend. And since we got closer to the 90s, with the erosion of the pre in power, also came the fall of the strict system that controlled and regulated organized crime around the plazas. So in a nutshell, when, when the state rolled back, the cartels seized the opportunity to gain greater dominance, commencing a new era for drug business now that the pre-authoritarian rule was disappearing. 
So the collapse of the La Plaza system obviously led to more turf wars among rival cartels, resulting in even more gang-related violence and even more murders than before. Since El Cambio, the change in 2000, uh, from the pre to the pan, in 2000, the narco cartels uh, have flourished and prospered in Mexico. States like Chihuahua, Baja California, Sonora, Sinaloa, and Michoacán carry the flag in the criminal violence in the news headlines that we can read over the internet. Even though the problem seems to be endemic in a majority of Mexican states. Unruh state in Mexico are suffering. Guerrero suffered last year the highest number of homicides in Mexico and the second highest, highest number in kidnappings. The LA Times wrote about Guerrero in February of this year. This, uh, it was sort of a sadly foreseen uh, article, and I open quotes, Guerrero could also become the next state to slide deep into chaos and create major problems for President Peña Nieto as he strives to project the image of a nation returning to, pre to peace after years of cartel violence, close quotes. So uh, in one of the suggestions that for policy, for security policy that scholars argue is that the obvious reasons why cartels operate so violently is because of the prohibition of marijuana, heroin, and cocaine. So to reinforce the idea that if illegal narcotics were decriminalized and strictly controlled, it is likely that cartels' profit will, severely, will be severely constrained and therefore the violent competition for control of La Plaza's might decrease. So a question that comes to mind, however, is what will happen if the Mexican government succeeds in the long run in the battle to dismantle the cartels? One answer is that, it's, is that it might merely push problem to neighboring countries, like as we've seen in Guatemala and, in, in, and Honduras in Central America, and the Caribbean as well, which are obviously less prepared to confront and tackle powerful um, criminal networks. But let's keep the focus on, on Mexico. Uh, here is where I address the title of these presentations on, on, on how we're going towards a safer Mexico, what needs to be done, and how can government and civil society address these issues. Uh, Mexico, rather than conducting a war on drugs, is, is obviously fighting organized criminality that no longer dedicates only to the export and import of drugs, but has diversified and expanded into other criminal activities. Even though Mr. Calderon's legacy to Mr. Peña Nieto uh, aimed to strengthen the capacity of the state to weaken the top cartels' leadership and to enhance the state capacity to fight these organizations, there are at least two major setbacks that remain a significant policy problem. First, first uh, Mr. Calderon's idea of a mando uni unico, or a unique con command, that lately uh, uh, Mr. Peña Nieto also reinforced is to centralize the command of police activities. So, and this is obviously uh, uh, related to the, the situation in Guerrero. It is difficult to tackle criminal activities with more than 2,000 municipal police forces, 32 state police forces, and the federal police force, all which have different degrees of coordination and cooperation. The second issue is impunity. Impunity persists as an obstacle, especially in local jurisdictions where crime remains unresolved. And again, it throws light towards the Guerrero situation. Uh, most murders in Mexico, particularly when the crime seem, seems to have taken place in the context of cartel violence, do not lead to an indictment, but much less to a guilty verdict. Both issues have taken together, uh, when both issues are taken together, suggests that Mexican state has been challenged directly for the control of the legitimate use of force, not recently, but throughout most of his modern history. Uh, my, my very final comments uh, briefly assess uh, Mr. Peña Nieto's policy scenario in terms of security. Uh, President Peña Nieto inherited obviously a challenging legacy from Felipe Calderón's sexenio. Uh, managing economic reforms, as, as he did at, at first, uh, was not the same as proposing and applying a new government security strategy. Mexico has seen a boom in policing reforms in the past decade that, uh, that have only shown little success. Even though the transition from Calderon to Peña Nieto differed vastly from El Cambio in 2000 in, in structural terms, scholars are right to emphasize how the theme of insecurity has highlighted the need to address profound social inequalities improve the coordination among different levels of government agency, and promote a serious push for proactive and responsible institutions. 
So Peña Nieto will have to adjust his security strategy in a changing political landscape. The recent Ayotzinapa tragedy is obviously a game changer for his government. He will have to deal with the unwanted coexistence of organized crime and adjust resources, behaviors, priorities, and most of all, he will have to address the political will at home and abroad to formally erase any, any toleration of collusion with organized crime. So the analysis points to a future where Mexico's rule of law still depends in a considerable way in how to link security and democracy more organically. Thank you very much. And first of all, uh, good afternoon to every, you, every one of you, and thanks for the invitation to speak at this event. I only have 15 minutes, so this presentation about how scarcity can be present in a country of abundance, as is Mexico, uh, is going to be the equivalent of writing about one's ideas on Twitter, so I, I apologize if I'm not elaborate on the points I will present. I will start first by explaining why I, among others, think that Mexico is a rich and abundant country. Then um, I will talk about the sad and embarrassing deprivation in which an important part of Mexico and the Mexicans find themselves. And then I will finish mentioning what I believe is a fundamental component uh, of the answer to our problems in Mexico and why I think we have failed to fulfill this requirement. First, let me start with the rich and the good, the richness and the good. On the good side, we can say that Mexico is a modern, versatile, and dynamic country. With around 170 million inhabitants, it has a young demographic base um, with a competitive labor force and the resources and infrastructure needed to attract investment and create wealth. Mexico is considered by the World Bank as an upper middle income country, belongs to the exclusive group of countries that form the OECD. Its major exports include crude petroleum, cars, computers, video displays, and is the world top exporter of silver, beer, tomato, and is among the leader producers of flat screens and aircraft supplies. <coughs> Recently, during the 2007 and 2009 uh, economic crisis, Mexico has experienced important economic downturns like many other countries. Growth projections are slim, and the labor market and the labor income of Mexican workers have been considerably affected. Even though the effects of the crisis on the Mexican economy have been higher than in other Latin American major countries, um, the fundamentals of the Mexican economy are considered to be strong, with the macroeconomy showing relative stability. Geographically, Mexico could not wish to be more fortunate. A country, the country has a 9,330 kilometer coastline with beautiful beaches and useful and efficient ports. In 2005, it was the seventh world tourism destination and its cultural heritage is one of the richest and most admired in the world. It is worth mentioning that Mexico is regarded as the fifth most biodiverse country in the planet. The greatness of the Mexican cuisine just corresponds to the relative abundance of food being produced in the country. All this means that Mexico has enough resources to procure every Mexican with a decent life. Mexico also has another important asset, its people. Mexicans are more those that work more hours per year in the world. This can be subject to different interpretations, but I can tell from my own experience that Mexicans are hardworking people. I do not need to mention how welcoming and friendly Mexicans are and how they will offer you the very best they have when the opportunity arises. Mexico is beautiful. Unfortunately, this is just one side of the coin. According to the Council of Social Development Policy Evaluation in Mexico, in 2012, 53.3 million people were living in poverty. This represents 45% of the population in Mexico, which is equivalent to the entire, est entire estimated population in England in 2013. Contrast this with the fact that Mexico is the 11th biggest economy 
and that the second richest man in the world is a Mexican. This can serve you to get an idea of the levels of inequality we have in the country. To illustrate how this problem manifests in a daily basis in Mexico, I will give you some examples. Mexico has a good number of internationally accredited hospitals which display state-of-the-art facilities and have top-class medical staff. But we also have immoral cases such as the one of a pregnant, pregnant woman and her unborn baby who both died after waiting five hours in a hospital and being denied medical attendance. A 13-year-old who was gunshot wounded in the abdomen and was also denied medical attention. And the case of a man who died after spending five days outside a hospital where he was not admitted because he was not able to pay for the service. In all these three cases, the persons were indigenous, the most vulnerable people in the country. I can also tell you about children that have to walk for two hours to get to school and children that are taken to school protected by bodyguards and that expect teachers to, be, to behave with servitude. The cases of those that spend years in jail because they steal food to feed their children and those that become extraordinarily wealthy after being public officials. So wealthy that it is impossible to explain their accumulation of wealth by ethical means and have never set a foot in one of the overpopulated prisons. Overpopulated perhaps because crime is present in every Mexican life. If not directly, indirectly, when you feel constantly afraid of being a victim of it. Extortion, kidnapping, assassination, theft, rape, you name it. Most of us have experienced it or have a close relative that has been already a victim. There are so many victims of crime because corruption opens the door for them to happen. According to Transparency International, Mexico occupies place 106 among 177 countries in their corruption perce uh, perception index. Is corruption perhaps a national sport? This sounds insulting to me, but I have to acknowledge that it looks like it is an offset. And there is corruption because there are no strong institutions and norms to stop it. A country where some of its people find themselves in the need to take up arms to protect their loved ones and their property from crime after years of extreme abuse cannot claim having decent, efficient institutions. Those who decide to turn their faces and ignore those that are suffering abuse cannot claim having decent social norms. Now, how does this contradiction emerge? I have told you about a, a rich and beautiful country whose people are hardworking and friendly. But at the same time, I put in the picture a sad scene played by the very same ones. As a French gentleman put it more than 15 years ago, Mexico has the very best and the very worst of the world. We might agree or disagree with this, what is important is that we recognize that these two opposites exist and that it is time to make the worst of them fade and make the best of them flourish. Making reference to Amartya Sen, we need to stop tolerating the intolerable. But there is still a lot of hope. The best in us, for sure, can build the way to a better Mexico. There is no panacea, but we Mexican, Mexicans have spent a lot of time looking and waiting for that exactly. A single, simple solution to all our problems. We also like to have an identifiable culprit, someone or something we can blame and make responsible for our calamities. This has made us fail to look at ourselves as both responsible of our problems and part of their solution. There are several areas that need extensive redesign and change. The usual suspects are, of course, education, health, productivity, the fight of inequality, crime and corruption, and so on. And please do not forget the structural reforms. If you want to hear the same discourse all over again, I recommend you search on the internet 
what intellectual celebrities said every time they are invited to Mexico to reveal the solutions to our situation. But let me warn you, they refer to the same old ideas. Now you can consider this as a sign of that in Mexico we have not paid enough attention or that we have not done so as um, we have not done as we should have done in the last decades. And you are right. But this can also be a sign of that something else is missing, something more fundamental, something related not to the big and macro, but to the, to the details at a micro level. Let me conclude. Let me conclude with what I think are these fundamental requirements for Mexico to be what all of us dream. I am willing to risk being simplistic just for the sake of simplicity and applicability. Thus, I would like to summarize in two words what I think we Mexicans and the people that love Mexico need to do to bring the country to a better state, to a state that the richness of the country and its people deserve. These two words are act and change. Act and change truly, responsibly, using all the available channels and having, having always as a requirement respecting the country and its people. We see people that are peacefully protesting for the recent unfortunate events of Ayotzinapa, and there, there is a valid reason to do so. These peaceful demonstrations represent the tiredness of the society and the unwillingness to keep waiting for a change in total comfort. But as valid and necessary as protesting is today, this is in no way the only thing that we need to do. We need commitment, hard, hard work, and congruence. For me, demonstrating my inconformity on the streets has been the, less, the least costly activity, together with coffee table talk about the problems and possible solutions. I know that to spur change, to contribute to equality, justice, transparency, and growth, we need to do more than that. We need to stop our participation and toleration of crime corruption, discrimination, injustice, violence, abuse of power, inequality, and many more social sicknesses on a daily basis. We need the young, the middle-aged, and the old, the ones that have decided to go out to the streets and the ones that have decided not to do so, to join all of those that are going to continue working for change in the long run. This is not an easy task for some, the fight for a better Mexico has represented the loss of their life, their freedom, their loved ones. And in the less dramatic cases, the loss of an alternative life accompanied with economic and professional success. I am thankful to all the people that have made sacrifices that maintain the benefits that my children, my wife, my family, friends, and me, and together with the my fellow Mexicans enjoy today. We should feel a moral responsibility and human inclination to respond with dignity to their sacrifices and their suffering. We must change Mexico now. And we can change Mexico now because we have all we need to generate true change. Thank you. <laughs>